of the European Commission in Portugal. We want to hear students' point of view. For the opening remarks, we welcome Professor João Nuno Calvão da Silva, Vice Rector for External Relations and Alumni of the University of Coimbra. Esteemed Director Professor Emilcar Falcão, first of all, I would like to welcome to the University of Coimbra the Vice President of the European Commission for Interinstitutional Relations and Foresight, Maro Shevchovic. I hope the pronunciation is this one. The Secretary of State for European Affairs, Ana Paula Zakarias, and the Deputy Editor in Chief of the newspaper Publico, my dear friend Ana Salopes. Thanking you all for your prestigious presence in this dialogue with our students about a theme that is so determinant for their, ger their generation, the future of jobs in the green economy. It is an honor for us to have such distinguished political and civil society personalities in our beautiful Colegio de Trindade, in an event involving a considerable number of students, most of whom are following us remotely, but surely with the greatest interest. I address a special thank you to the Directorate General of the Coimbra Academic Association, the structure that represents our 25,000 students in the person of its president, João Assunção. To the Erasmus Student Network, with President Beatriz Gonçalves, representing the different 105 nationalities who study here, and Luis Coimbra, representing the PhD students of this secular higher education institution. A big thank you is also due to the representation of the European Commission in Portugal in the person of Sofia Alves for her important collaboration with the University of Coimbra. With 731 years, the oldest and most prestigious university in Portugal, being open to the world was and will always be our trademark. In terms of international relations, we highlight two fundamental dimensions the Portuguese-speaking space, and the European Union. On the, one, on the one hand, teaching in Portuguese is the institution's trademark, one of the five UNESCO universities also because of this historical and cultural dimension. On the other hand, Portugal's integration in the European Union allows the University of Coimbra to participate in a noteworthy political project and enjoy the advantages of an internal market of great worldwide economic and social relevance. At the European level, we highlight, for instance, the great success of the Erasmus program at our, at our institution, even in these COVID times, as well as being involved in the European campus, ECTU, together with six other prestigious European universities, Poitiers, Padova, Salamanca, Yaji, Turku, and Jena. Initiatives such as this one reinforce the University of Coimbra's commitment to the ideal of the European citizenship, the desire to be at the forefront of a stronger European integration and increasingly contributing to the renewal of the Union project. Long live the University of Coimbra, long live the European Union. Thank you all. Now, we give the floor to the moderator, the Deputy Director of Public Newspaper, Ana Sá Lopes. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome. We are here in the beautiful Coimbra University with Mr. Vice President of European Union, Commission, sorry, uh, Maro Sekovic, e a Sra. Secretária de Estado dos Assuntos Europeus do Governo de Portugal. Muito obrigada. Uh, we will discuss a core question to the future of European Union and for the youth of European Union. Uh, what kind of jobs people will get with the European Green Deal? The things will be very different than they were when some of us, me, uh, Mr. Vice President, uh, Dr. Ana Paula Zacarias, were students. So the things are terrible different. So it's very important uh, you can uh, discuss uh, it with uh, the students, the youth, uh, the people who, who confront with a new world, a uh, green world, we hope. Uh, so uh, please, Mr. Vice President, um, I invite you to introduce this matter. 
the problem of jobs in the green economy. To you, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I really would like to uh, uh, thank uh, Rector uh, Mr. Falcao, but uh, also Mr. Vice Rector, who very nicely introduced uh, uh, this topic, uh, Mr. Calvan da Silva, because I know that uh, everything was uh, organized in the matter of a couple of weeks, and uh, I can tell you that I really feel honored and privileged to be in such a historic uh, university, in such a historic place, and to know that here for centuries uh, uh, the young people have been getting the knowledge, the professors for centuries have been sharing uh, their knowledge uh, with, the, with, the, with the next uh, generation. And I think this is exactly the process which we are going through right now, even though I totally uh, agree with, uh, with uh, Anna that uh, to date has uh, uh, totally new characteristics. We had a feeling even before uh, COVID crisis and before we felt the pressure of the climate change that life is getting somehow faster. We've been seeing how our children are spending more time on the social media, how gradually all our lives are more uh, oriented to this online world. And I think that currently uh, with the COVID-19, we see how all this has been accelerated, that we suddenly all had to become digital, that we had to get the, the, the information uh, from uh, online sources. And from one side, it was very convenient, but from other side, we miss this human interaction. And of course, this is very much combined uh, by the pressures of the, of, uh, on the young uh, generation because uh, for us it was, uh, I would say, quite normal that in your life career you change the jobs two or three times, that you get a good university education, you've been kind of keeping up uh, with the new knowledge in your profession, but I think with the, with the new generation of today it would be much more, uh, much more challenging. Just to offer a uh, few numbers which are very much linked uh, to this twin green and uh, digital transformation. As uh, Mr. Vice Director Jane uh, 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 pointed, uh, pointed out, uh, kindly pointed out, uh, uh, we are focusing a lot of our foresight activities on uh, uh, like studying what I would say this twin transformation is bringing to the uh, young generation and of course to the, to the labor market. So just few figures not to overload you with the numbers. So currently, as we, see, uh, as we see it on the labor market in, uh, in Europe, we have 80 million uh, people mismatched uh, by qualifications. It means that they are or underqualified or overqualified. We have uh, uh, asked the em employers how they see um, the, the situation on the labor market and what we are getting uh, uh, from them and we are scientifically uh, testing the figure is the fact that 40% of uh, employers uh, have big difficulty in finding uh, the proper candidates, especially for these new jobs, which many of them just didn't exist just a few, uh, few, uh, few years ago. And uh, uh, according to uh, our assessment, uh, currently we would need uh, uh, in, in Europe something like 100 million people to update the skills. So therefore, the social summit in Porto was so important because they focused exactly on uh, uh, this uh, problem and the, and, the, and, the, and the goal, the target, to have 60% uh, of adult population uh, to be permanently updating their skills through different requalification courses. I think it's a very important decision. So my message to the, to the young generation is uh, that to have a good university and good results is very important because you develop the skills, how to learn quickly, how to adapt but the, the challenge uh, for you would be that you will be updating your skills all the time because the changes are so dramatic. And the last uh, example from the European Battery uh, Alliance, which I have a uh, honor and privilege uh, to lead, it just shows that within a very short period of time, we can really create new industry, uh, new ecosystem in, in Europe, and from the situation where we haven't been uh, producing the batteries at all, um, uh, now we are the, the number one zone for investment in this sector where uh, we are investing three times more money into this sector <laughs> than, for example, China. What is the major challenge when I'm talking to these leading companies in this association? Again, are the skills of the people. Just this one industry needs 800,000 uh, mechanical engineers, uh, 
chemical engineers, the, 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 the people who would be good lawyers, because I know that that's a tradition here, uh, to protect the patent, to protect uh, the, this new, I would say, industrial uh, knowledge, uh, which would be gathered in the research and institutes. And therefore, even the traditional professions would kind of be affected by these new demands on, on the labor market. So therefore, I'm really glad, and I once again would like to, uh, to thank uh, uh, the, the university for having the possibilities not only to talk to the students but also to hear from them what are their worries, what are their concerns, how they would like uh, to shape uh, the destiny of Europe, to, uh, to shape destiny of the destiny of their personal lives. And uh, last word of thanks goes to uh, Anna Paula because I think she's uh, an excellent uh, representative of uh, always very efficient Portuguese presidencies because if I would have to list all the successes of the presidency, here will be for a very long time and students will not have a chance to intervene. So I just want to say that she's fantastic. It's great uh, pleasure to work with you and I'm very much looking forward to our discussion. Thank you. Okay, well, good morning everybody and thank you very much Maros to start with these wonderful words. It's uh, fantastic. Um, magnificent rector, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, also, Mr. Vice Rector. Um, and uh, Anna, thank you very much, and to the students, because uh, you are the reason we are here today. We, we have been in Coimbra for uh, these two days um, discussing the future, the future. We started with the conference on the rule of law, because the future of Europe has to take into account our fundamental values. This is from, it's, 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 uh, it's the core of the union, and I am very glad that the rector was there to open this conference uh, yesterday. Then we continue our discussions in the afternoon yesterday in the format of the ministers uh, of, or uh, secretary of state for European affairs. Uh, and, uh, and there we discuss another important element of the future. We cannot go on with uh, without the ones that are on the periphery. If we want to build a future, we need to bring everybody on board. And so we had a very interesting discussion on the perif ultra peripheric uh, regions of Europe, uh, including Azores and Madeira. We went on to discuss resilience, how we go about the future in terms of becoming more effective and more efficient um, in terms of innovation, in terms of sustainability, um, in terms of creating jobs and developing an economy that takes these two characteristics into account, uh, innovation and uh, sustainability. And what can we do to make Europe uh, indeed a relevant uh, element in the context of all nations uh, of the world? So, and we, we went a step further we had the first ever meeting of ministers for the future. That was, that was fantastic. It took place here in Coimbra with all the young people and uh, the striving uh, movement of uh, this university. I was really very happy that the first meeting of the ministers for the future took place here yesterday. Do we need ministers for the future? I think we need people for the future. Uh, and, uh, and we need this discussion and it's also very interesting that this discussion is taking place in the context of the Conference on the Future of Europe. If you go and see the platform on the Conference on the Future of Europe, you will see that there are more than 500 events registered. One of them is this one. And there is more than 12,000 people that have already um, entered their ideas, their um, initiatives uh, in terms of the future of, of Europe. So today we gather here to, in this context to, to discuss the future of jobs. The future of jobs and not, uh, you know, not all jobs, but particularly the ones that are connected uh, with uh, sustainability. And very briefly, I would say that uh, COVID-19, we all know, uh, brought us changes at the speed and the scale uh, never seen before. Um, and for the world of work, uh, COVID-19 pandemic has been particularly harmful. Uh, according to ILO, 81% of the global workforce, corresponding to 2.7 billion workers, were affected by the pandemic. 
And in the EU, the number of unemployed people rose to 3.5 million between 2000, uh, the end of 2019, 2020, and 2021. So we are at crossroads. A lot of people lost their jobs. And the ones who lost their jobs first were the most vulnerable. Migrants, women, young people uh, that were particularly vulnerable because they didn't have uh, you know, proper contracts. So it's about time that we look into these weaknesses and see how can we build a more resilient uh, and sustainable form of, uh, um, of, of work environment. Then we have another data that is, uh, that's also very difficult. Uh, in terms of the labor market, uh, climate change is also a, a big issue. Uh, there is an estimation that 1.2 billion jobs, approximately 40% of the global workforce, are at risk because of environmental degradation. And uh, um, 71 million people could lose their jobs because of climate change. And, uh, and this is also something that is a bit frightening. And so we need to find ways to counteract this. And what can we do? I think there is a, a lot of, that can be done at the level of uh, governments, but also at the level of the enterprises, at the, at the, the uh, level of the, um, the, uh, the private sector, uh, to, to counteract this meaning that we have to create millions of new green jobs. And what are these jobs? What, what, what are these? I, I was looking into some uh, ideas and uh, th there are green builders, water quality technicians, recyclers, drone engineers, green designers, everybody that works on sustainable uh, energy environments. Then there is the well uh, care um, economy, um, areas of well-being and, uh, and uh, taking care uh, of others. Only here in Portugal, in terms of renewable energies, the cluster um, have already created 10,000 direct jobs, including 3,000 just in the wind cluster. So I think there is a lot of challenges, but there are also a lot of opportunities. For instance, also in the domain of hydrogen, it's a new area. Uh, there are, um, the, the Vice President uh, Shevkovic uh, talked about the battery alliance. There are many areas where new jobs are, are being created. And the last point, because we will continue the discussion, is that we need to get ready for these jobs. And to get ready for the jobs, we need to have the right skills. We need to have universities that are preparing people, not for the old jobs, but for the new jobs. And, uh, and here, we need to put our heads together to find the best possible ways. Because we need to look into the future and see what is, what are the skills. For instance, in Oporto, we have said we need that at least 60% of the workforce that is employed have at least one skilling or reskilling activity per year. One skilling activity per year? Is this all that we want? We need to do even more because people will need to have the right skills and the technology is changing so fast that we have to do it very fast too. We are on a fast track of skilling and reskilling. And here, universities are the center for this. So, thank you very much, and I Obrigado. will continue the discussion with you. Now, Beatriz Gonçalves, please, of the Erasmus Student Network, Coimbra. Thank you very much, please. Sorry, <laughs> technical <laughs> problems. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the University of Coimbra for the very kind invitation and for the opportunity to participate in this conference. I would also like to thank the Vice President of the European Commission and the Secretary of State for European Affairs for your remarkable and very thoughtful words. And I would also like to thank our moderator and my colleagues here today. 
Uh, I joined ESN Coimbra almost three years ago, and since then I have had the privilege of becoming part of a team of enthusiastic volunteers, most of them former mobility students, and we work together to better support the international students here in Coimbra. Throughout these past years, we have had the opportunity to witness the tremendous impact that studying abroad has on these students and on our city. Moving to a new country and a new city, often without knowing more than the basics of the language, takes an incredible amount of courage. Doing so in the middle of a pandemic, like so many continue to do, shows just how determined we are in pursuing this dream of studying abroad, even if this experience is slightly different than we have read or heard from our colleagues and friends. As much as technology helps us communicate easily with people from all over the world and enables us to learn about the world with just a few clicks, there really is nothing like packing our bags, moving to a new place, ready to face all the challenges that are part of this process. And in these past few years, we have met students who choose to come to Quimba by train instead of plane because they're worried about the carbon footprint that is involved in this process of moving abroad. Others dedicate themselves to learning Portuguese during their stay, which is, according to many international students, a very difficult language to master. And they ask any Portuguese speaking person they meet to talk in Portuguese with them so they can learn, so they can have this contact with a new language and a new culture. These students have taught us that adopting simple changes to our daily lives can really make a positive impact and they have inspired us at ESN Coimbra to be more mindful of our habits in our day to day as a youth organization. They also really want to be involved with the local community, not just as tourists, but as locals. And they often choose to spend their free time helping the most vulnerable communities of our city, volunteering at a shelter for people experiencing, experiencing homelessness, for example. These small yet very meaningful actions are just one way of us students of saying, that we care really deeply about where we live and that we want to help make it a better place for our community. So much so that many international students, when they go back to their home countries, they are inspired to become more engaged in their communities and some of them even start voting, <laughs> which is very true. Um, all of this studying abroad experience can be summed up in one word, I think, and it is resilience. It's this incredible capacity to meet each challenge head on and to adapt constantly to a never changing world. This does not mean that we students are not scared of the unpredictability of tomorrow because we are. It just means that we are better equipped to face a future full of uncertainty, but brimming with new and exciting opportunities. We are ready to face wherever comes next. So to conclude, and if I may be so bold, I would like to ask the decision makers in this room to keep engaging with us students, to include us in conversations just like the one we're having today. Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. Now, please, the president of the Academic Association of Coimbra, João Assunção. Obrigado. Magnífico reitor da Universidade de Coimbra, professor Dr. Amilcar Falcão, Mr. Vice President of the European Commission, Sorry, Maros Sefcovic, right? Very close. <laughs> Very close. <laughs> Senhora Secretária de Estado para os Assuntos Europeus, Doutora Ana Paula Zacarias. Senhora Diretora Adjunta do Jornal Público, Doutora Ana Sá Lopes. Senhor Vice-Reitor da Universidade de Coimbra, Professor Doutor Calvão da Silva. Cara e caro colega, cara e caras e caros colegas. I would like to begin by thanking this opportunity given to students of Coimbra to talk with the Vice President of the European Commission about the future of Europe and employment in a green economy. This is a very important theme, especially for a young generation that is aware that, this, that, that its intervention in the community, in politics and in the economy will be fundamental to ensure the progress and the future of our planet. 
The past year has, has been extremely difficult for everyone. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a very negative impact in our lives, putting on hold our daily routine and all our plans and priorities. With the pandemic, the world's attention changed radically, leaving what once was essential behind to second plan. Around the globe, uh, we saw unemployment, massive use of disposable goods, and an unprecedented digital transformation of the whole society and activity. Indeed, it has been a hard battle, um, a qualitative challenge that we have overcome with very, very difficulty. However, we are certain that, that everything has been done to guarantee the safety of millions of Europeans spread across the 27 member states that constitute this European dream, our European dream. In this month of May of 2021, we see finally the end of this pandemic problem. The resilience of the European institutions was empowered us to overcome this difficult challenge together. together. But as I said, during this complex year, we left behind some, some of our priorities, uh, the protection of our environment, uh, the, develop, the development of our economy, and the well-being of all Europeans. Therefore, with the resolution of the pandemic, it is up to the European Union, its institutions, its leaders, and its citizens, us, uh, to invest in these challenges, which are very important for our generation, the young people generation. The theme discussed here today appears to be a way of refocus refocusing, once again, the European political agenda towards these challenges. Prepare the future so that it is both economically prosperous and environmentally sustainable. As a young European student, I'm counting on the European Union to achieve these goals. And I know that this will only be possible with the construction of an European community that responds with solidarity in order to mitigate structural socio-economic inequalities between the member states and an European Union that sees the future of our planet as the number one priority of in all its economic reforms. This generation of young Europeans to which I belong uh, lies all its hope in the efforts for, of our leaders and of our European Union. In past, uh, together, we have already demonstrated our ability to respond to the greatest adversities. So, it, finally, it has now come to the, to the time to guarantee our future together, citizens, leaders, and institutions. I hope this is our future. Thank you. Thank you, Joao Assunção. Now, Luis Coimbra, please, uh, representative of uh, PhD students of uh, University Council. Thank you. Um, uh, good morning. I'd like to acknowledge my, my fellow uh, participants here, um, Vice President of the European Commission, Maros Sefkovic, the Madam Secretary of State for European Affairs, um, Madam Ana Paula de Grias, um, my colleagues, uh, João Assunção and Beatriz Gonçalves, also the, our moderator, our Vice Rector and our Rectors. Uh, it's with great pride that I'm here today as to speak here. Um, the invitation, I would like to, to, to thank uh, very much for the invitation. Uh, I will focus more on the PhD students um, and our future careers and, and the green economy. Um, if, you, if you look, about, if you look to, to PhDs, um, 15 to 20 years ago, almost all of PhDs were professors or were in academia. Many of them already hired while, while taking their PhD. Today, we have about 22,000 students in Portugal that are taking their PhD, with about 2,000 new doctors every year. So, we have to ask the question, where, where are the new jobs? There are, there are no, there's, there's no room for everybody in academia, so where are the new jobs? And are our PhD courses giving us the tools to, to engage in new career paths? So I, I try to look for some answers for these problems, but I'm a PhD student, so I, uh, instead of answers, I found more questions, but I would like to extend myself. Um, if you look up uh, wh where our PhD students, uh, PhD holders uh, employ today, we, we, we see that uh, about 83% are in academia, uh, about 10% about in, in state, and only 6% in private and public companies. So, and if we complement this with the information about the stimulus hiring of, of the last year, only 8% of PhD holders were selected for, for this stimulus. So, 
uh, the, the hire, we are hiring the, the PhDs that need to have a, a long career in, in, in research. Um, but we know now where not to look. It's not in academia. There are careers in academia. They are very important. But we also need to search elsewhere for new careers that foster innovation and use the skills that PhD um, the, uh, have um, after the, the end of their courses. So I, I look for, for so co colleagues, former students. So where are they are, um, outside academia, where are they hired? There are still some, some preconceived ideas in, in private companies, essentially, about PhDs. They think they are too um, theoretic, they are not pragmatic, they do not solve their problems, which is further from the truth. You, you cannot be further from the truth. So we need to incentivize um, measures that help companies to talk with PhD students while they're taking their PhD courses to topple that border. Uh, one great um, European uh, incentive for this is the scholarship in companies. So uh, we have FCT that funds uh, students that are taking their PhD in companies at the same time as universities and put these two worlds together. Many of them, after they, they're finished their PhD, are hired in those companies. So here's one possible answer. Which take this to the next, next question. Uh, what are our PhD courses teaching and are our skills enough for these new jobs and new careers outside uh, academia? Um, so we are including them in other sectors of society, different career paths. They are focused, while we are taking our course, we are focused in produ producing papers, going to conferences, providing exec results that take a lot of time, and of course, citing everything correctly. Uh, in companies, the, there's, the focus is, is in other skills. But these are skills that are important. We are dutiful, we are innovative, so, and we think outside the box. There is great opportunity for innovation and green uh, innovation by taking the PhDs and putting them inside, in, in the society. Um, but they need to be, uh, done with, the, with skills such as um, the soft skills, uh, working in teams, speaking freely about their, their, their ideas, that in, when we look at PhD is usually a solitary endeavor. So we need to take the, these solitary uh, students and put them in workplaces that are team-based. Team one possible solution that is very widespread in, widespread in Europe is doctoral schools. Uh, there are many models depending on the university, but there's many things in common. For example, career coaching that from the start of their course, they, foster, they guide students to their desired career path. Um, other, other, other things that they provide, multidisciplinary subjects, soft skills like languages, uh, other skills. So, I tried to do this very shortly just to, to raise these two questions. What the, is where are going, we are going to work and if our skills are good or are adapted for the future. Um, and is, I think there's great opportunity in reviewing how we think about PhDs, looking at the future and thinking, okay, we have here people that are very highly trained, very highly skilled and very expensive to train <laughs> Uh, so where can we put them in um, places that will foster innovation and develop Europe and, of course, here in Portugal too. So thank you. That's just... Obrigada, João Assunção. Please, uh, Mr. Vice President, uh, your response of the, the students, the questions of the students. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, it was very impressive to, to, to listen to you, to Beatrice. Uh, uh, Joao and uh, uh, Louise, and um, just a couple of uh, uh, quick uh, reaction as a former student who studied abroad in different places. I, I, I know how challenging it is, but at the same time I know how, how, how beneficial it is and how much you rely on your fellow students, uh, on your older colleagues who just show you around, uh, uh, show you how you should learn, 
uh, how uh, you should prepare for the classes, how to do the thesis, and simply in, uh, very often the friends from that time are friends forever. And I think this is what is uh, very important for, uh, as it was rightly pointed out by uh, Joao, by uh, forming that uh, solidarity. And I think it was very nicely put yesterday by the Austrian uh, minister that solidarity and unity in Europe is our uh, major strengths and the feature of our resilience because we help each other in Europe. And I think it uh, goes on among the member states, but it's very important that it has to go uh, very clearly in, into these interpersonal uh, situations. And I was talking with Mr. Uh, Vice Rector how challenging it is, especially for the foreign students right now, because you have a lot of students coming from Brazil. And I can imagine that in uh, these very difficult times where you have uh, problems with flight, uh, uh, different uh, COVID uh, uh, restrictions, and I know that to study online, and I see that we have a lot of students uh, who are watching our discussion, it's much more challenging, it's much more difficult to stay focused, to, to, to learn, to get uh, uh, the information. So I, I, I'm sure that uh, once, let's hope this summer, we will be all properly vaccinated and we can, we can come to, back to the life as, we, as, as much as we knew it before. And I'm sure that uh, the students will need a lot of help, especially those who couldn't be here, uh, who, who couldn't participate in classes and who had to learn uh, just online very often from a big distance with the time difference and so on and so forth. I'm, I think that your work will be, will, be, will be very important and I think that we have to think collectively as, as a universities, as a, as, as a government, uh, how, we can, how we can help uh, also the, uh, the students uh, to catch up, to hide the quality of education they, they, they deserve and to really have the bright uh, future for them and for us, because I mean investment in our young generation and investment of the, of the future of our, of our uh, continent. And uh, Joao was very nicely talking about what are the major, major challenges uh, uh, of, the, of the mankind. And when you look through this, I would say foresight papers, and I'm very privileged that I am getting a lot of them. So if the scientists look at uh, such a major characteristic of COVID-19, so very often you hear two characteristics. One, that it's accelerator, that it accelerated good and bad things at the, at, at the same time. But suddenly we had to jump from, let's say, occasional browsing on the internet in the total online submersion, and uh, we had to uh, do everything online, to talk to your family, to do your job, to, to be in contact with your, with your friends and colleagues. And at the same time, it's a great divider. Uh, I think Anna Paula was very rightly pointing out that what kind of pressure COVID is uh, uh, exerting on the most vulnerable one, on, on those who have uh, precarious jobs, who didn't have the good contract, the, 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 the young people. And we see what is happening uh, also very often among the nations or within, within the society. So indeed, uh, we are going through very, very difficult, uh, uh, very difficult period uh, of, uh, I would say, the, the human, human uh, development. And it would be very much, I believe, the Europe uh, who uh, would have to lead also this human effort, how to overcome the crisis, how to show that we are taking care not only about ourselves, but we are ready to share, help others, and uh, to demonstrate it within our societies uh, in this intergenerational solidarity, but also with the solidarity with, the, uh, with the, uh, other countries in the world. And to Louise, I really would like to thank you for what was for me, I think, very refreshing and one of the, I would say, most uh, synthesized uh, analysis of the, of the problem of the PhD students. You said it in few words, but very often is written in very thick, uh, uh, very thick textbook how, how to deal uh, uh, with this challenge. And I think what is very important here, that what the PhD students have is what we need. They have a brain power and they have a discipline because I am former PhD students myself and, and to write the PhD thesis, you really have to be very focused to, do, to go through all the scientific materials, to, to be thorough, to, to quote properly, uh, and you have to have the capacity to absorb a lot of information. This is exactly what I was saying in my introductory remarks the labor market needs, to absorb this new information, uh, uh, these quick changes and developments which, have to, which, you, which you have to process, you have to distill, and you have to kind of, uh, suggest uh, uh, what kind of new innovative approach we need to address the, the challenges which are in all these uh, uh, very often uncharted territories of these new technologies, future-oriented uh, uh, professions. 
And therefore, I think the uh, ideas uh, you presented, uh, scholarships uh, in the companies, I think probably the Germany is one of the most advanced in that respect that so the, all the, the university uh, uh, studies and when you are PhD, you are automatically part of the research team or some kind of there is support for innovative uh, companies. And I think that's really thought for all of us, how can we maybe generalize uh, this approach that when you are uh, uh, going to do very hard studying in the PhD, how to combine it uh, with, uh, with, the, with the practical uh, research work in the concrete companies, in concrete research labs, how we can, how we can support it jointly on the European and uh, the national level, and how to combine with uh, career coaching. Uh, uh, when I am talking very often to the most uh, successful uh, research incubators, uh, when I'm kind of uh, asking what is the difference between very successful research uh, incubator and let's say everyone. Successful, I mean all of them they have usually very good uh, uh, scientists and researchers, but not all of them have very experienced business coaches. Somehow to kind of also channel that creativity of researchers that's very good what you are researching here, but we need to get something to the market next year or the year afterwards. So how to do the applied research, how to do the practical research, how to bring the knowledge from the lab uh, into, in, into the market uh, for the profit, of course, uh, of uh, uh, the personal satisfaction that now I see how my research work is kind of amalgated into the uh, concrete uh, success of the company. And then, of course, uh, to the, uh, to the, to the so society uh, uh, at large. And indeed, as you pointed out, so that research is very often an individual effort, so the team skills, uh, soft skills, teamwork, uh, all this is very important. And therefore, I think uh, uh, what you pointed out uh, uh, so eloquently, scholarship in companies, career coaching, and increase the number of, or percentage of the PhD students uh, working in the, in, the, in the private sector. I think this should be the three highlights uh, I will definitely take from, uh, from this discussion. And uh, hopefully we will be able to reflect collectively how can we use your advice uh, um, uh, to make uh, uh, and benefit from the hard work and the brain power the PhD students are bringing uh, to the European Union. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Secretary of the Council, please, please. Thank you very much for the three of you. Very, very interesting uh, elements for discussion here. I have uh, three points. Beatrice, you are absolutely right. You need openness, flexibility, participating uh, capacities, resilience, capacity of engaging, looking into the world in a different way. Um, these are the personal requirements that the world nowadays push you to, to make and to take. Uh, you also need courage. And this is something that young people normally have, courage. But we need to, to push them to take this, this new initiative, this capacity, always with this open-mindedness, this uh, new ways of looking into, into things. Uh, at the same time, with generosity, with solidarity, uh, pushing for cohesion, uh, looking uh, to the environment, uh, building a new, a new world, because this is uh, what we want to do. So we have to work on these capacities, these soft skills that uh, Louise was mentioning. They are fundamental, enough of this idea of silos, where we have the social sciences in one side and then the so-called hard scientists on the other. We need both, and we need both together. And this takes me to the second point, which is, the COVID-19 showed us clearly that we need scientists. Who produces the vaccines? Who makes the texts? Who worked uh, you know, night and day to, to, to make us have this capacity of having the vaccines on time? Um, we have uh, uh, new factories for the production of all these new elements. So, but we have also to understand the soft qualities of people when we pass through a crisis like this. We cannot forget that we are always people and we have our own vulnerabilities and, uh, and we need to be listened to. So scientists need to have this new way of looking into things um, that brings um, multidisciplinary studies that have this 
soft capacity of looking into things, combining um, a huge, a lot of information with the capacity of thinking uh, for itself. And this brings me to the third element, which is we are here at the top level, I would say. We came, you know, here is the university, is the last moment of our knowledge. But to arrive here, we need to look at the kids. What did we learn when we were kids? Did, did they ever told you that you had to think for yourself? And uh, did you, were you incentivized to, to share your opinions with others? Uh, what type of education are we giving to the little kids? And who is giving this education? Are we forming the right teachers at this point? Wouldn't we be good, uh, we, will we be good teachers <laughs> if we go and teach in a school today? So I think we have to, uh, the university also is the place to form teachers. And it's a huge responsibility towards the next generation. So I think this, this element of, of, of teaching and teachers and what we teach for the future is fundamental because this is what people will be able to do and this marks what they will become when they enter through those doors of the university. They will be different if they are taught when they are kids that they should be open-minded and have you know, a whole new perspective. So I think these are three elements that are very uh, important that we need to look at them together. And then just another word about uh, Louise and, uh, and, uh, and the scholarship programs. Uh, indeed, that, but the other day I was, li I was seeing a, an uh, advertisement from Netflix that wanted um, an engineer with a master on management and uh, a post-graduation on philosophy. And this was to do what? The new program they have on, you know, something on animated uh, films or something like that. So it, it's interesting that you have to combine all these qualities, but to do all this, you need invest investment. There is, there has to be investment. And this investment has to come from, from, from the union, from the European Union, and it also has to come from the government. And I'm very glad to see that in these uh, new programs that the government is putting now forward on the uh, National Resilience and Recovery Plan, there is, for instance, uh, 200,000 new jobs in the digital area. But again, digital is not just you know, being able to tap in a computer. You have to, you have, to have other skills uh, for that. But investment is fundamental. The capacity of the private sector and the public sector to work together, bring in people uh, from the universities to the, okay. to the job place, uh, it, it promotes a totally new interaction that is very good for those that are already there and have to do their reskilling too. So it's, it's a complex environment and we need to see this in a complex way, avoiding silos and avoiding thinking, uh, simplistic thing, thinking that uh, will not get us there. Yeah. Thank you. Obrigada, Sr. Secretário de Estado. Passamos agora à parte das... Uh, well, we... <laughs> question and answer section, sorry. I speak in Portuguese. Um, now it's the part of the, the section of the question and answers, and I, I'll ask... Uh, the first participant, Alexandre Filipe Matias Correia. Uh, uh, hi, thank you very much uh, for being here. Yes. Um, I'm a PhD student, which is focused on, uh, I work in the Institute of System and Robotics. My work is focused on electric vehicles and uh, automation of work. Um, a, concept, a concept commonly associated with green jobs is uh, normally automation. And uh, automation, despite increasing efficiency and uh, more often than not profits, uh, heavily limits the existing uh, job pool. Uh, it is, of course, a trade-off between efficiency and uh, creating employment. So my question is, uh, how will the EU tackle the problem of excessive uh, automation and maintain the equilibrium between effective uh, green jobs and a sustainable employment rate? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Sarah Diana. 
Cabete, Diogo de Oliveira, uh, Sara Vieira, Sara Vieira, uh, you, please. Thank you. I'm Sara. I'm a PhD student in steel and composite construction. So my question is, due to the pandemic-related increase in remote work, questions come up who will end up bearing additional costs, such as increased elect electricity costs and expenses for cell phone and internet plan. Who should cover these expenses? In addition, the increase in digital resources being used for work purpose has resulted in an always-on culture which has a negative impact on the work-life balance of employees and leads to increased risk of depression, anxiety, and burnout. So when will the right to disconnect become the new reality? What are the European institutions' motions for long-term resolutions on this matter? Thank you. Mr. Vice President, do you want to, to reply? Thank you. Thank you very much because bo both questions are extremely relevant uh, in these days and uh, I I'm, I'm very glad that uh, you're actually studying uh, indeed uh, the areas uh, which are so important for, for uh, today's uh, or future-oriented uh, trends and uh, technologies. And if it comes uh, to the automation and uh, uh, robotics, uh, I think that what uh, you are clearly uh, highlighting is the important to find that equilibrium, that, 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 that proper balance, which uh, from one side would not hamper in any way uh, the European economy from the point of view of efficiency to be at uh, cutting edge if it comes to the creation of uh, value added, uh, uh, to be uh, really in a position to use the, the, the most advanced uh, uh, t technologies because uh, the, the international uh, competition, uh, especially in the field uh, you, you are working on and you are studying in, is extremely fierce. Just to take the, uh, uh, our two uh, major uh, economic competitors like United States uh, or China. So I think that uh, we have to really uh, do our utmost to be able to embrace uh, uh, these uh, new technologies, bring them to the market. At the same time, I think what is uh, very important is uh, that uh, once, once we see these uh, efficiency gains, it shouldn't go at the expense of the people. We have to be fair society because this is what uh, the uh, European uh, social model is uh, built on. So we have to make sure, uh, as we've been discussing at the beginning, uh, that uh, uh, the people will get the possibility to be retrained, to be reskilled, or to be upskilled, because you will always need uh, the qualified uh, uh, people to, uh, to work uh, uh, in, um, uh, in um, these uh, very often highly automated uh, factories. And another, I think, very important element, which we are discussing now um, in the European Union, I can say, because it's on uh, the level of institutions and the member states, it's also the fair taxation. You cannot have uh, uh, the international giants uh, very proudly displaying the profits of uh, 44 billion euros and not paying a, a, a zero euro tax on it. Simply that's not fair because they are profiting from infrastructure. They are profiting from the people who've been educated uh, in uh, uh, these, uh, these countries. Uh, they are simply benefiting uh, from the overall uh, state of the, of the society and Therefore, I think we just have to make uh, sure that uh, uh, all of the companies and all the activities are, 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 are uh, properly taxed and the people are uh, treated fairly. So it would be, I think, such a, uh, a fight for the, uh, uh, for the proper uh, equilibrium. Uh, how to be at the top level global market if it comes to efficiency, uh, modern technologies, how to make sure that our society our people are, uh, are prepared for that, uh, to make sure that uh, uh, we would uh, continue uh, to maintain uh, the European social model, which is uh, so attractive, such a magnet for, I would say, everybody, everyone who lives outside of the uh, European Union, to be, as I said at the beginning, the first society. And uh, 
uh, Sara, uh, I think, uh, clearly pointed out what is, I think, on the, on the minds of, uh, I would say, most of the people in the European Union right now, because all of us, including us, we've been really uh, spending a lot of, a lot of time in our living rooms, uh, sometimes in uh, uh, difficult situations, especially where you have uh, uh, both parents working, the, the, the students studying, and very often in an uh, in, in environment with several computers uh, trying, to do your, uh, trying to do your best in, uh, in, in your job. And I think the, the new pattern of work clearly has developed uh, over the last year. And I don't think uh, that if we, if we look at all the labor codes or at the, the contracts which have been signed, uh, uh, that this is properly reflected yet. Because it came so sudden, it was, it, it was, it was new. And therefore, I think you, you're absolutely right that we just simply uh, have to look how this should be properly uh, addressed. And I think here, the, the social uh, partners uh, dialogue with the governments and with the the European institutions would be the key because my personal uh, take on it is and my personal experience is that of course if you uh, are asked to do your job at home you should have the uh, you should have the proper con conditions you should have a, the computer you should have a proper cell phone you should have a proper equipment to actually do that uh, uh, do that job uh, at home and there is a lot of things like uh, the, the insurance uh, when you're actually working at home and uh, accidents just simply uh, happen. And all these things are, I would say, new. And I think we have to address them because I think that in one way or another, uh, the, the, the home office will become part of the new working routine. You're very right that being um, in that situation that you have to work uh, home, and I think we see it uh, also with our employees in the European Commission. I saw different uh, studies, uh, what, what is the impact, uh, especially on the, on the young people, anxiety, depression, the feeling of uh, uh, loneliness, uh, loneliness. And uh, uh, I was quite struck by very impressive statistics that how many households are the uh, one person Household, so it's indeed uh, very, very difficult, and uh, 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 therefore uh, I think that we have to address these issues as a societal, as the issue of, of labor law, labor labor codes, to make sure that also this uh, relationship is uh, uh, is properly managed, and then uh, the right to disconnect and right to be forgotten, uh, because uh, this is what was my advice. Uh, 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 to, to my children, you know, when you're a student, you have a good time, so sometimes you put on Facebook uh, things which two or three years later you would like to get rid of, yeah? Uh, and I think all of us went through, <laughs> through, through that phase, and I think it's, 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 it's uh, indeed, it's fair. It's, it's, fair. it's absolutely right. <laughs> and, uh, so the, 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 and, this is, uh, and this is actually, you know, one of the topics which we are debating already for quite some time in, uh, in uh, uh, the European Parliament, how this is feasible, how can we force the companies to do that, and how actually you, uh, you should be the masters of uh, your data once you put it there. And I think this goes uh, uh, together with all that uh, uh, efforts uh, which we are now bringing to, to manage uh, the privacy of uh, personal data and uh, the, the overall regulation, which is uh, so needed uh, for all the social media world. Thank you, Mr. Vice, Vice President. Uh, now, Lee, uh, please, Luis Silva in Zoom, the question. Uh, hi, good morning all. Um, so, uh, I am a uh, PhD student in governance, knowledge and innovation. And uh, regarding the future uh, of work for PhD students and uh, regarding also the fact that Coimbra is in a region that suffer and will suffer from regional disparities and asymmetry, uh, what role can Europe have in these two areas? Uh, so the future of, um, of work for PhD students and uh, with a view to reducing uh, the regional asymmetries uh, and uh, as we speak today regarding the, the green economy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, Ligia, Ligia Hermano Santos, please. Good morning, my name is Ligia. 
I am Brazilian and I am a PhD student of human rights. <clears throat> and it is well known that some soci sociological scientific areas such as research about anti-capitalism, anti-colonialism, and anti-patriarchy don't, don't used to be subject of public investment and even less the market interest. So my question is, how to promote the future job market for female scientists, even the ones who are from social, sociological areas? How these women, these women, can be integrated in a non-academic society, for example? Thank you. Thank you, Ligia. Now we have uh, in the tablet by online uh, two questions. One from uh, Joana Freitas from Porto, or Porto. If I am working remotely for a company in the USA, I lose my right to social protection. This is a dissentive, how could we overcome it? And uh, from Rui Moreira, uh, don't, I don't know where, <laughs> somewhere in the country, I suppose, with the increase of academia, how will this future of green economy accommodate to the new market needs? What's the role of the digital economy? I invite uh, Ms. Uh, Senhora Secretária de Estado dos Assuntos Europeus a responder a estas perguntas, por favor. Well, um, these are all very challenges, uh, challenging uh, issues. Um, we, we are facing a, a transition, a digital and green transition. And, uh, and this will bring us enormous benefits, uh, new jobs. We're talking about green jobs. We're talking about new digital jobs. Um, these are immense opportunities for young people and not so young people if we think about reskilling other workers. But it also brings, like everything in life, um, big challenges. Uh, and uh, we will face the issue of automation. We will lose many jobs uh, in areas where, um, you know, for instance, with electric cars. We see nowadays with electric cars that uh, we don't need a lot of mechanics. Uh, this uh, small enterprises of a mechanic that were there when, uh, when I was, uh, you know, in my 30s, and we would go and take the car, and the guy would fix your car. This doesn't happen anymore. You take it to a place where it's full of computers, there's no oil on the ground, everything is very clean. So it changed, it changed. So we probably need now, uh, first of all, to prepare young people to do this type of jobs. But, but this comes to, with, with a cost, and we have to think about this cost. And this cost um, is, as, as uh, um, I think, Sophia? Uh, was, was saying, no, so not Sophia, sorry. But one of the, one of the uh, young uh, um, uh, students uh, with us here today, uh, she was mentioning this terrible issues of the balance between work life uh, and, and family life. How are we going to deal with this? How are we going to uh, deal with uh, these questions of uh, loneliness, of being, uh, you know, feeling without protection, um, you know, being compared with a machine that does a certain job that you cannot do, uh, and we are seeing a huge increase also in artificial intelligence in all uh, different industries. So we need to look into this, and the only way we can do this is, number one, um, try to keep the European social model. For the moment, it's the only tool that we have. And this tool means that at least you have access to health, that you have access to education, that you have access uh, to uh, social security, and that you, at the end of your working life, you, you have a pension. You have something to live with. This is the minimum minimorum. We have to keep it. And on top of this, we have to build these new relations of work. Um, you, you have to have the right to disconnect. You have to, to see how do we increase the social contract? How do we do collective bargaining? Uh, the roles of trade unions, it's very important. 
People nowadays seem to see like trade unions kind of far away, but they are fundamental uh, in this interaction with the world of work. Uh, trade unions have a role here. And uh, of course, the European Union is trying to also do its best uh, in many of these areas, though these areas are basically uh, of national competence. This is another issue. Sometimes people ask of the union something that the union cannot give or cannot give yet because the discussion has to start. Uh, there is the directive on transparent and unpredictable working conditions that is being discussed. There is the youth employment support as a bridge to jobs for the next generation. The youth employment support is very important. There is a reinforcement of the youth guarantee. Um, there is the European instrument for temporary support to mitigate unemployment risks in an emergency, the SURE that we have created. There is the proposal for a directive on adequate minimum wages in the European Union. By the way, very difficult to negotiate because there are several member states where this situation uh, is higher and others where it's low. And uh, the ones that are up here, they do not want to lose what they have. And the ones that are here uh, are afraid of the costs that will take uh, this initiative. Uh, there is the proposal for a directive on binding pay transparency measures uh, to to bridge the gap, the gender gap, in terms of payment in the European Union. Uh, there is the Commission recommendation on effective, uh, active support to, an empl to employment following the uh, COVID-19 crisis. Uh, there is the European approach to a trustworthy uh, intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, and uh, there is also uh, the forthcoming uh, action plan on social uh, economy. So, uh, a lot of initiatives are there uh, in terms of the protection of workers, bridging the gender gap, and also addressing uh, these matters. But I'm sure we need to do more. And uh, we need to bring again here the knowledge from different areas. And indeed, we need to bring in these issues of social sciences. Maybe I am a bit biased because I am an anthropologist. That's probably it. But when I, being an anthropologist, meaning that I look at people, that I look at cultures and their diversities and the need to understand this, if we want to build a new, uh, you know, fair and more just uh, society. And indeed we need people that are experts in human rights. And indeed people that are experts in, 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 in the rights of the workers and, uh, and uh, new, we need to come up with new philosophies for the, the work. And even a new philosophy of a person as a worker. Who am I? I am a professor. I am a diplomat. I am a doctor. Is this what we want to say in the future? I am what I do, or am I something else? So we are on the verge of, of these big questions that we have to produced now. Yeah. Muito obrigada, Sister. That's that. that. Muito obrigada. Thank you. Uh, uh, Alexandre Felipe Matias Correia, uh, do you uh, put your answer? Okay. Yes. We already did it. Vamos encerrar agora? Mas como? Temos que encerrar. Temos que encerrar. Uh, então não, já não põe a pergunta? Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Uh, we, we must uh, close this interesting uh, section. Uh, thank you very much, our Rector, University of Coimbra, Coimbra University, the Vice President of the European Commission, the Sr. Secretary of State do Governo Portugal, muito obrigada, and uh, several uh, Several sessions like this, we hope uh, it will happen in the Conference of Europe. So we have a long of time for these debates. Thank you all very much. And the word now, the director, please. And now, to give the closing remarks, please welcome Professor Emilcar Falcão, Rector of the University of Coimbra.
timid Mr. Vice President of the European Commission for Interinstitutional Relations and Foresight, Marus Sefcovic, right? <laughs> Not bad. Stimid Ms. Secretary of State for European Affairs, Ana Paula Zacarias. Stimid um, Ms. Deputy Editor-in-Chief of the Newspaper Public, Ana Salops. Stimid Students, uh, João, Beatriz, Luis, all of you uh, here in this beautiful place and also all those who are remotely with us. Uh, let me start uh, to thank to my friend and colleague Vice Rector uh, João Nuno Calvão da Silva and his team for the great job uh, that have been done uh, in the co-organization of this event, this impressive event. Thank you very much. Um, we have just uh, witnessed a remarkable session of European citizenship reinforcement with a fruitful dialogue between our students, national and foreign, and senior officials in the European and national governance, under the superior moderation of one of the most respected journalists in Portugal. In a decisive subject for the future of generations, for the social and political sustainability for the European Union. As Oret said yesterday in the opening SEP speech, the University of Coimbra does reinforce is its European commitment and honors its social responsibility of contributing to a more sustainable, sustainable development of our planet. According to the Times, uh, the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings 2021, which measures the global success of universities in fulfilling the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the University of Coimbra is currently the most sustainable higher education institution in Portugal, the eighth in Europe, and the 21st in the world. This being the, on, the only worldwide ranking that assessed efforts of higher education institutions in meeting the goal of having a better world, and especially leaving a pandemic crisis. The University of Quim is the third best in the world in reaching the sustainable development goal number two, zero hunger with good performance results in the area of industry, innovation, and, well and uh, infrastructure uh, in 13th place, and good health and well-being in 44th place. The University of Coimbra is in top 100 in nine of 17 sustain sustainable development goals and top 200 in the remaining ones. I'm sure that today's dialogue was another important step in reinforcing our commitment to a greener and more socially balanced and fair Europe. Count on us in this fundamental aspiration for humanity. We count on you. Thank you all.